Miru Dalwala is, by any definition, a success. An immigrant to Canada, she is co-owner of one of BC's premier Indian restaurants, Vidges. She's a self-taught chef, mother of two, cookbook author, mentor to young women chefs, a huge supporter of immigrant women, and a vocal advocate for sustainable food. Miru calls herself an activist, with good reason. A business person once told me that uh, when you're an entrepreneur, you're always living on the edge of a knife and that there are so many variables. I mean, rent and tax and yeah. regulations. And many nights are spent worrying about, well, this is, I can't do this anymore. It's going to fail. Mm -hmm. Is that a mirror of what you went through? In September of 1996, when Vikram and I were upgrading from our 20-seat restaurant on um, Broadway to a 45-seat restaurant. I was uh, eight and a half months pregnant, and we had just opened the Vidges on 11th and Granville. And um, I remember being so overwhelmed that, oh my goodness, I am going to bring a baby into this world. How are we going to take care of this baby based on the restaurant business? And I remember having like, not a panic attack, but I remember it actually it felt like lead and so overwhelming that my livelihood is just so precarious and I'm bringing a child and based on this livelihood. And um, even when you're doing well, even when, you know, Vidges, I mean, we're a busy restaurant. Even when you're doing well, there's so many other facets outside of the public domain where you just think, no, where we can't go on anymore. Right? We just can't do it. Whether it's labor, or whether it's, uh, I don't know, you can't afford this, or the landlord is saying that, and then you're always afraid, no matter how busy you are, you're just always afraid that, okay, that's going to be the night that something horrible happens with the food, or something just horrible happens, and everybody's going to find out, and no one's going to come to your restaurant anymore. You're always living in fear. Even on a family vacation, you're never off. You're just, at, if your restaurant is open, you are never off. And Carol, the first time I actually could sleep at night and fully relax, that I don't have to worry about the restaurants, uh, different stresses, was um, when we were forced to close down for the pandemic in 2020. And that, of course, on its own was just a major catastrophe yes. for the business. Yes, but we all of, our, all of us were shut, like everybody was shut down, not just Vidges or Rangoli, everything was shut down. So even though I had no idea what the future held, I had no idea what this pandemic was about. So there was a sense of dread, but at the same time, there was a weird sense of relief that, you know, I can actually sleep tonight and not worry about what my manager's report is gonna say at midnight and not worry, okay, if I don't read the manager's report at midnight, right? What am I gonna wake up to in the morning? So, but I'm saying it with a smile on my face as well. So I think that's how uh, the restaurant industry has been for me. And you had to make major decisions. You permanently closed Rangoli as it was. That was really hard. I don't think we can keep both restaurants open. So we decided to save the greater good of Vidges, we were going to have to shut down Rangoli and just concentrate everything at this location. It really hurt to close down Rangoli. I felt like I was, like it was a human being. It was a human being. Kitchen staff, front staff, our customers. It was, it was a lot of human beings. But never waste a crisis. And so you came up with the idea of baby food. So we shut down Rangoli and, uh, and things are closed except for takeout. And I don't like to get bored. And I learned that from my father because growing up, if you ever went to my dad and said, I'm bored, he would either get mad at you that you're too dumb. And I'm, I'm, we're talking about the 70s, right? And he's like, well, the, you know, you, you, no, no intelligent person gets bored. Or he'd make you do something really boring <laughs> that you didn't want to do. Well, if you're bored, well, come on, come and help me clean the car or let's do mow the lawn or something like that. And so uh, I have this thing like I just, um, if I'm sitting there 
doing this and I'm bored, or um, if I'm stressed, right, and what's going on, I need to do something else. And so it was a perfect timing for me. Is it possible to come up with what you think would be an ideal food product? And so I got to work on that. And so I said, okay, well, first of all, I got to challenge myself. And um, I cook for grown-ups, I cook for children, and I thought, you've never cooked for babies before. And Babies are probably, we can all of us agree, right, the most innocent of all human beings, right? Babies don't choose mom and dad. Babies don't choose what they're going to be eating necessarily. They're fed. So I thought, okay, number one is going to be babies. And then number two, you're going to focus on, all right, um, accessibility, the justice of accessibility. And so that's what I did. I got to work. All of my research, and I came up with these recipes, and I thought, I'm not going to screw over the farmers. Um, I have to make it accessible, and it was a financially learning, accessible. financially accessible, and not based on charity. And so I came up with a um, income-based pricing, and by income-based pricing, it was more of pay based on your agency, not based on um, charity. So if I'm earning two hundred thousand dollars a year, okay, twenty dollars to me are going to be what two dollars are to you if you're earning twenty thousand dollars a year. The agency is the same. So that was my model that, okay, we're going to be in this one circle together because we really wish to be in the same circle. Pay 60 bucks for 12 because you can. Pay $42 for 12 because that's kind of what I need to keep things going. Or pay $24 for 12 because that's what you have. How did you make that work? I had $60 customers. I had $42 customers. And I had $24 customers. And I made money. I mean... Overall, it lost because I made too much product and I had to donate it. But I know now that um, my next phase of it, right, I, I can make money from it. Do you think that growing up as a teenager when your father had bankruptcy problems and you were technically homeless oh, for a time, yeah. did that affect the kind of entrepreneur you are? That had basically, I, at that time, I thought I would never ever be an entrepreneur. I was afraid of business because of that bankruptcy. Um, and that was such a horrible, horrible phase in life. It was shameful. My parents were down. My little sister started sucking her thumb again. Um, we were living in this horrifying basement. And, um, and then I ended up going back. I was lying to everybody. I was actually lying because I didn't want to be so embarrassed that, yeah, well, we're homeless now. And um, I was so afraid of that fear. And at the same time, I finally understood what it felt like to be the child of homeless parents. I didn't think I myself was homeless because I didn't make any of the decisions. But I was the child of parents who made a very big but very earnest, sincere, intended mistake. And uh, I think that's what actually drives me with everything that I do here. Are you more cautious because of that? No, no, I'm not more cautious because of it. I think I'm much more aware of all the human beings that are involved in it. What kind of leader are you? I think I'm an awesome boss. I'm not embarrassed to say that. It's something I'm really proud of, right? I love, I don't even like the word boss. I don't like the word, but I am, right? I love being in the position that I am because I think I'm just really good at it and I think I'm, I enable safety. I enable it because I knew what it felt like not to be safe. So um, I can see how that affected, for instance, your strategies as a business person in the restaurant business mm -hmm. because you have decided to have your kitchen all female yeah. and immigrants. Yes, yes. It was not a necessarily like I sat down and made that decision. Uh, when I moved here, uh, Amarjeet, who's actually here right now, Amarjeet was a part-time dishwasher at Vidge's. And uh, Vikram was doing everything back in the front. And then finally, not even finally, really quickly, I said, all right, Vikram, this is going to work out. You're really good front of the house, so why don't you focus on customers? I'm not a customer person, so why don't you focus on that? And I'm going to focus on trying to figure out this kitchen. It excited me learning how to use a knife. And so, so you, you weren't a chef at that point. Oh, God, no, no. <laughs> I had to teach myself at 30. Uh, I was 30 years old. I could make a chickpea curry that my mom had taught me, but it was like opening up a can of tomatoes and my mom's spices that I would pick up from her house. 
So I figured out how to chop the onions and the garlic and started experimenting. But Amarjeet and I did it together. And then we got busy and it, it was something I enjoyed. I, I liked doing it. And then we needed another person. And then Amarjeet said, oh, well, you know what? There's another woman. She's just arrived, um, been there. And she's looking for work. She doesn't have any experience. Can I bring her? And I said, sure. Um, so that's when it became a little ding. You know what? This works. We can do this. And so then I did start. Sure, bring in more, bring in more, bring in more, bring in more. And that's how we ended up all women um, immigrants. It's not like I was anti-man. I want to be clear. I am not an anti-man person. But um, it takes a certain type of a man to want to be able to work and to be able to work in a big room full of women cooks and chefs and prep and so on. Was there a culture clash between the front of the house, which would have been English speaking, mm -hmm. I assume, yeah. and yeah. kitchen staff? Absolutely wouldn't? not. Never. That's the beauty of Vidges. There was not ever a culture clash. The biggest culture clash was me and Vikram, probably, <laughs> in the restaurant. <laughs> you know what we always said, just because he and I look Indian, right? Just because we have Indian parents and we look Indian. That, oh, yeah, two Indians married each other. Absolutely not. He was born and raised in India, right? I was born in India, but I was raised in America, right? And so actually it was this an American and an Indian who got married who both looked like Indians. So the clash was actually me and Vikram. And in the beginning, we did have one or two, you know, front of the house. But one minute, shouldn't they be learning how to speak English since they're in Canada? And I said, well, shoulds are really good, right? We should all be doing a lot of stuff that we don't do. But they're coming in from Surrey. They're taking public transit from either East Vancouver or Surrey. They have young children. They're, um, they're learning how to navigate here. And then they're working eight hours a day. So between you know, making lunches and um, taking care of elderly parents and babies and working and public transportation, by the time they've cleaned up their kitchen mess around 9.30 at night, they don't have the time or the mental capacity to go to English-speaking school, right? Because then they have to show up here again at 7 a.m. So why don't we leave that? That's their business, okay, about learning English. But they're doing an awesome job here at Vidges. So the burden is on the front staff to communicate with the kitchen. So I took the reverse role that, nope, you English speakers are going to learn how to communicate with the non-English-speaking kitchen. And I have faith that you can do it. And if you've got a question, come to me or Vikram. In particular for women chefs, there's also the problem of the culture of the restaurant industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be really rough, not just the hours, but you hear some pretty harsh stories about a lot of kitchens. I didn't want a stressful kitchen. I wanted to come to work every day and be able to relax. I wanted to come to work. And I didn't want that energy, that tight. I didn't want that. And so maybe very selfishly, that's what we did um, in the kitchen. It's a stressful kitchen there. I'm not saying we're not stressed out, but the way we deal with it and the way I insist that we deal with it, we don't add stress to stress. No temper tantrums. No temper. We do not add stress to stress. It doesn't work. It doesn't come out in the food. And I really, it's important for me. Mira, you've been uh, an activist all your life. What do you hope that raising money for women, young women chefs will accomplish? Um, so for us to be able to do it our way, I think one of the reasons why it's really hard uh, for women chefs is because we aren't men, right? And so what is my feminism? My feminism isn't to push men off the stage and say it's our turn. <laughs> We're taking your place now, you know, it's us. My feminism is having to get on the same stage and to be able to shake hands with everybody. We're all on that same stage, but I get to be a woman, right? I'm not going to behave like you. So you get to be a man, do whatever you need to do, but then I get to be a woman and do things my way as well. And so for me, everything that I do, whether it's, it's Yes Chef or Worth or Les Dames, it's uh, being able to give women the confidence so scholarships for young women who are thinking about yeah. uh, the culinary world mm -hmm. is a very important leg up. Yeah. In 1995, Indian food was brand new to Vancouver. 
right? The combination of me and Vikram was brand new. You had this, you had this more than vivacious man, full of energy and just out there like this, right? Then you had me so excited about the kitchen and what I was going to be creating inside, and we were madly in love. So we had a new cuisine, this couple. Um, that's a rare, that's very, very rare. And I accept and, I'm ve- and I acknowledge that, that that doesn't happen to a lot of women, right? It doesn't happen. And so we didn't have a lot of stress because we were just growing together. But a lot of women who want to get into that business, into the, into the restaurant business, you know, servers, dishwashers in the kitchen, how are you going to get the money to do what you want to do? Right? How do you get that leg up to do what you want to do? So again, that's what the scholarship is for. And what I hope the scholarship does is it eases the stress. So again, um, we can figure out how we wish to do things being us versus trying to be what men think we should be or expect us to be. Another of your big interests, of course, is food security mm-hmm. and the idea of sustainable mm-hmm. food. Yeah. It is my responsibility um, and my job, right, to educate based on what what I I do professionally. And it it hurts my feelings. It does. It hurts my feelings um, that we're overfishing. It hurts my feelings that we don't care what we're eating just because it tastes good, that we're, you know, we're not caring about what is conventional farming, um, pesticides, fertilizers, GMOs, um, the oceans, the animal husbandry. It's so, it's so big and complicated. Then add food waste to it. Um, there's a lot. And whatever I can do to get that point across, and all of it boils down to um, if you just choose yourself to eat wisely, and care about what you are putting in your body and where it comes from, just you, right? Don't even care about anything else. Automatically, the dominoes effect is that you're doing good. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to focus on. You try to bring this into the restaurant and your menu, as Mm -hmm. you say, and watch how much oil or whatever other ingredients. Uh, I know you had an experiment with insects, and I have to say, when I was in China, I had the um, pleasure uh, of eating Asian scorpions. Okay, I have not had that pleasure. No. Well, no. <laughs> well. So, how did that work out? So, I was reading an article in uh, um, in the New York Times magazine, and it, the guy's name was David Gracer. And uh, it was in the last page of the magazine and how he was experimenting with eating insects and how different cultures ate different insects. And, um, and then another David in the article was David George Gordon. And he was at University of Washington, or he was in Seattle. And it was talking about how in terms of protein and iron, um, eating, I think it was eating, I think two ounces of crickets was the equivalent of riding your bicycle for your health and the environment. And eating a six ounce piece of, piece of steak was the equivalent of driving a big SUV for the environment and your health, like in terms of like stationary. And I just love the, I'm, I'm blundering the metaphor, but I really liked it that, okay, the insect is a bicycle and the steak is a big SUV. And that just attracted me. And so I contacted, it's a David George Gordon, I went through the, the white pages at that time. The internet was just starting, I think. So I found his phone number and then I called him and then he, I don't know what I was getting myself into, then he crossed the border with his bugs. And he sat down at this round table at the old restaurant and with me, Vikram and Mike, and I had no idea. And he just brought out these different bugs to eat, moving, like wax worms. And uh, then he had the crickets and so on. And I'm like, what the heck have I just done? And then Mike Bernardo, our GM, and Vikram turned into like little boys on the playground, like, ha, 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 we're going to get to eat bugs in front of the girls. And, uh, but it was, um, it was, I had to do it because I started it. And so one of the things you do for work is I, you know, I toughen myself up and I said, just give it to me. And I put that warm in my mouth. And, um, and it, was, it was really, it was educational. And so I thought, all right, just try it out. Why, why not? Try it out. 
And I contacted Reeves Cricket Ranch. And they sent me crickets. And I started experimenting with it. And the flower was uh, about half cricket flower, and then a quarter bran flower, and then a quarter all-purpose flower. And I remember this recipe. And I kneaded it, and I did. And it was, it was delicious, Carol. It and was you put really it on the menu. I put it on the menu, but I forgot to tell my health inspector that I was putting bugs on the menu. <laughs> so there was all this, uh, oh, Vidges is putting crickets on the menu, and the media was all over, and every outlet was talking about restaurant in Vancouver, puts crickets on the menu, put it on, and then two days later, uh, the health inspector shut it down and said, um, Look, people call us about cockroaches in restaurants. You can't just serve bugs without telling us. You have been so open about your private life. And in fact, your cookbooks, you've written at least mm -hmm. three, but you mm -hmm. tell the story of you and Vikram and the restaurant and even your separation. Yeah. Were you hesitant to be so public about your private life? No, not at all. Um, and I don't mean in terms of like celebrity gossip at all, but... Um, I don't think we share enough. I really don't think we share enough about each other. And we can do it in a dignified way. I don't want to like, like hang on you, right, by sharing my private life with you. But I feel like if I don't share with you who I am as a person, right, if there is no connection between me and you, for say, oh, OK, yeah, you know what? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, divorce sucks. And running a restaurant with the person that you're about to separate I didn't want to pretend for the sake of the public, oh, we love each other, oh, this, or, oh, and I didn't want to publicly fight either. Um, divorce happens. Couples work together. It doesn't all have to be net. We hide too much, I think. And I, 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 I don't, and I think it adds to our um, loneliness, that we feel this need to be polite and give this impression that everything, oh, everything is good. I, unless I let you know how hard it was, um, well, maybe, you, um, let me phrase it differently. The more you know about me and Vikram and Vidges, again, in a dignified way, I think subliminally, the deeper and better you feel when you come and dine at Vidges. What's your personal hope for the future? For me, it's just all about that human connection, whether I'm a business person, whether you're working in the hospital, but we need to start feeling more for the other human versus um, protecting ourselves because we don't wish to be hurt or because we don't wish to be embarrassed, but put ourselves out there. Thank you for all you've done for Vancouver, Canada, and oh, the world. Thank you. Miru Dalbala, a BC legend.